NASA has done it again, successfully landing a rover on Mars. And partnered with a flying drone, the Perseverance will begin its search for Martian life. After seven months of interplanetary travel, NASA engineers sat through those seven terrifying minutes while the rover entered the red planet's atmosphere, bolstered by grit and a lot of math. The rover touched down safely. And on top of that, the rover tweeted from Mars. <laughs> now you can tweet from there. Check this out. Hello, world. My first look at my forever home. <laughs> Let's bring in Mike Massimino. Give us a moment to tell you about him first. He's a former NASA astronaut, now a professor of mechanical engineering at Columbia University, and the senior advisor for space programs at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. Oh, and one more thing. Mike has a team record for the number of hours spacewalking in a single space shuttle mission. Basically, you are quite qualified to tell us about this, Mike. Now, Mike, you've been the person that we are cheering for, that we see back down here making that landing. So I wonder what it was like for you watching yesterday. Where were you when the rover landed? What were you thinking? Oh, uh, well, I was uh, actually with uh, NBC News now <laughs> that yesterday afternoon before the landing and during the landing and then got to say a few words after the landing. So thanks very much for keeping me busy. Uh, but a little <laughs> bit different though, you know, when we, uh, when we, I went to space, I went to the Hubble Space Telescope, we were flying the space shuttle and people were there. So if there was a problem, we were able to intervene. When you send a spaceship to Mars, that's a long way away. Uh, there's nobody on board. And even the communication time is so long between Earth and Mars where that spaceship was that it needs to be autonomous. So that vehicle went to a very interesting place, as you mentioned, a dry lake bed. They wanted to explore there. A difficult place to land, though, not necessarily an even surface. And he had, it had to be able to do it autonomously. So a lot of really interesting tech was used, artificial intelligence, so that thing could land. So mm -hmm. a little bit different. They're kind of crossing their fingers in this case that everything works well. And in my case, we were able to intervene if necessary, which I think is actually an easier thing to do. Yeah, Mike, let's talk about that and how hard yeah. this journey was in the landing. I mean, we've heard plenty about this seven minutes of terror. Are we being overly dramatic there, or is that really an accurate way to describe what was going on there? No, I think that's pretty accurate, especially <laughs> with people involved. They've been working on this thing for about 10 years. So just imagine you're working on this project and so many things need to go well. Lots of what I call miracles have to happen for all this to happen, and the miracles are just stacked up one after the other. And they get the spaceship built, they get all the sensors built, they do all the planning, all this hard work for the whole team, and then they get the spaceship there to Mars over that long journey that you described. And now it's got to land. If it doesn't land, the whole thing is not, you know, if it crashes, no good. Everything you did for 10 years, for the last 10 years, okay, I hope you had a nice time doing it, but. You're not going to be able to do the science and continue with the mission. So those seven minutes, they're really relying on the aut automated systems to work. And I think that's why they describe it as uh, seven minutes of terror. So certainly for those people involved, and probably, I guess, for us taxpayers as well, because we invested yeah. in this thing. Uh, yeah, a little Ooh. terrifying. It's all worth it for that moment of joy, though, right? The pictures of them oh, clapping oh. in the controller. <laughs> Oh yeah, you know I, I, that is just I love those those. I was waiting. I really wanted to see that. You know, the, seeing the pictures from Mars is, is great, but you know the human element to this, and you hit on it. You know that there's people involved, even though it's a it's a, a, a no no an uncrewed spaceship going to Mars. It's a rover, and there's no people there. There are people involved. All of us on Earth are able to share in it with the glory of it, with the in the science that's going to be coming back. And with that achievement, and of course, the team that is responsible for it, that put their heart and soul into this to mm. see their reactions, is just great. So I'm really happy. It's not that easy thing to do. About half, it's about a 50-50 proposition landing something on Mars over history, but they're getting pretty good at it over at the mm. Jet Propulsion Lab <laughs> and the NASA team. So they make it look like we expect it's going to be it's going to be uh, okay every time. And. Fortunately, this time it was, so good for them. Good for all of us. Yeah, right. Mike, now that the rover is there, what questions do you hope it will answer? I'm glad you asked that too, Joe. I think that it's, there's gonna be some very exciting things coming out of here because, since it, because it was a tough landing, the reason it was, as I said earlier, is because they went to an interesting place. This place was they, this is a dry lake bed that they think was about the size of Lake Tahoe. So there was water there, long time ago, ancient times, billions of years ago, there was water there. So they're looking for signs of life. They're looking for signs of water maybe underneath the surface. The signs of life probably would be fossilized, fossilized evidence of microbial life from ancient times. 
but still that's very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. It's also, it has a lot of other cool stuff on it. Like it's got a, a way to record sound, whether it's the sound of the vehicle or maybe the sound of the Martian wind. It's got a helicopter that's gonna be flying around. The first time we've had an aircraft flying around an atmosphere <laughs> around the planet other than Earth. So that's going to be, uh, I, th I think, a, a huge advantage to having that vehicle that can fly around because rovers traditionally have to move very, very slowly so they don't get stuck. When you get up above the ground, that thing can make a, a, a lot of headway and survey an area and, and, and make some more discoveries and also maybe look at more interesting places that the rover can travel to or maybe we want to explore in the future. So there's a lot of stuff. They also want to return a sample as well eventually. That's going to be about another 10 years from now. So there still is a lot of milestones to go in this mission, not just the science with the rover and with the helicopter, but also with uh, the future of sending another spacecraft there to retrieve a sample from the Martian surface mm -hmm. and return it to Earth. So that's going to be something to look forward to in the years to come. And Mike, also, we can't have you on, somebody who's actually been to space and not ask you about that. We watch those moments of celebration in the control room and obviously us not even anywhere near that control room and also down here on Earth. What's it like for you on the other side? Tell us about that. Uh, to, what it's like to be in space is just uh, glorious. It is, uh, it is a lot of, a lot of uh, jubilation like uh, you saw from the people in the control room there. Uh, yeah, this is a little bit different. My interest was always in sending people places. And I think that this is sending people to space, to the, to the moon and so on, where we're hoping to go back to and then on to Mars. So I think from my perspective, as someone that's been to space and as, a, as an astronaut, the idea of sending people to Mars, I think that's what this in some ways is all about. You know, there's mm. a lot of understanding our planet as well by, by, by looking at Mars, understanding how our solar system formed, looking for other signs of life answering questions not only about Mars, but Earth, but also paving the way for people to go there. So they're gonna be looking at things like the existence of water. What do people need to go to Mars? You're gonna need water. So they're gonna be looking for signs of water. Maybe there is some water underneath that surface that people could use. Also extracting oxygen, we need to breathe. We can't breathe the air that's on Mars, so it's CO2. So we're trying to take the O2 out of the CO2, that's another experiment they're doing, to see if we can create a breathable oxygen. So. I look at this as, as serving a lot of different uh, goals, but uh, for me, as you asked my interest in, in human space flight, uh, I'm looking at the new astronauts we have just selected and we're gonna be selecting in the next few years. Hopefully they'll be going to Mars and this rover not only will give us information about Mars and Earth, but also pave the way for those future astronauts to go there. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.